Well, during our years in the Midwest, one of my favorite activities was spending Monday and Wednesday mornings every fall in the Springfield Museum of Art. It was a small museum with a solid collection, beautifully curated, and it hosted additional exhibits to broaden the horizons of the town's uber-conservative population. For a few months each year, I gave tours to fifth grade students, most of whom had never been in an art museum. I loved being with the children. I learned a great deal about their lives and their reactions to the art. I, of course, had my favorite pieces at the museum, but that didn't always translate into what was the most intriguing for them. One piece we all agreed on the last year I was there was a wonderful example of installation art housed in the museum lobby. The artist, Miles Dininger, had put together this beautiful creation that was colorful and dynamic, and it was a tremendous hit with the children. Nettinger is an electrician by trade, and so his work is filled with wires and straws and twist ties and all sorts of everyday items that connect together in his creations. I think I loved it as much as the children did because it spoke to me of the beauty and the messiness of the ways that we are all interconnected in this life. The author Elizabeth Slade tells about her experience with a similar piece of art, one that she encountered at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. She relates that one afternoon at the museum, as she roamed its massive halls admiring several huge canvases in color and expertly painted figures and scenes, she came across a piece that was very different. It was a wall of circuits and gadgets and wires, connecting, crisscrossing, circling around and around, and it immediately caught her attention. The name of the piece was Interconnected. She called to her friend Ziggy, who was at the museum with her to look at the work and said, what do you think about all this? Without hesitation, Ziggy tipped her head to one side and said, love, I think it's all about love, as she walked away to admire some enormous lips hanging on the opposite wall. Slade says she stood for a long time imagining the art as a representation of her current work around the topic of chosen family. Interconnected, she thought. How does this interconnectedness that is so intriguingly depicted in art actually speak to the ways that we as individuals come into relationships? She thought about how being beyond being born into relationships with others, what is it that happens when we relate to people in the world? Think about it yourself. How do you sidle up and make lasting connections with some people? How do you choose people? that eventually you begin to think of as family. In this series on reimagining the family portrait, we have heard over and over again that people define family by who they love, not necessarily by whom they share DNA with. I think this is perhaps a good working definition for families today, yet I continue to learn how hard it is for all of us to understand these new family dynamics. Sometimes becoming a family is actually very simple. Some chosen families are simply born out of necessity. Some of us just can't rely on our biological families. Some of us have been completely rejected by our families. Others of us come from biological families that cannot affirm who we are as individuals. Sometimes we become disconnected from the family we grew up in, and it makes building a new, intentional, healthy family so very important. In reading about a variety of chosen families, I've learned 
they usually end up being carefully woven together in order to create safe spaces for growth and for love without limits. When biological families cannot love in the ways that are needed, chosen families can pick up the slack. And chosen families, no matter how they come into being, bring unanticipated gifts. Chosen families become each other's people, even though they get frustrated, disappointed, as well as delighted and soothed. At the end of the day, chosen families do whatever they are called to do to make life easier and more wonderful for each other. If we can broaden our thinking of family beyond blood relations, then we see the people around us, the ones we've made a commitment to as our family. I love the example of what I consider the chosen family of Jesus in the New Testament writings, Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. They were a family that loved Jesus and supported him. And when life fell apart with the death of Lazarus, Mary and Martha turned to their brother Jesus and knew he would catch all of them. We don't know a lot about Jesus and his biological family. We only have limited insights to them. In the gospel text, there is the story of Jesus and his parents in the temple when he was 12. If you know that story, you know that his parents left him behind. But some scholars have said that maybe by that point, he was a little ahead of them in spiritual insight. So I'm not certain if they left him behind or if he was quietly leaving them behind. Our next encounter is after Joseph is apparently gone and Jesus is at a wedding where his mother Mary is also in attendance. There is this scene that I love where Jesus turns the water into wine. But that miracle does not happen until after he and his mother have had an uncomfortable discussion. We can just imagine how his siblings must have felt about this brother the brother who left their carpentry business to travel around the countryside with 12 rather strange individuals and absolutely no means of supporting himself. That would make even really close siblings put some distance between themselves. Many would say that the 12 disciples of Jesus called to follow him were in essence his chosen family. And I agree, but I also think there was a special closeness with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. In fact, they even sounded like family sometimes. In the narrative, when Martha complains to Jesus about Mary not helping her in the kitchen, Jesus responds in a manner that reminds me of my older brother talking to me. And when Lazarus dies, the sadness that came over Jesus seems to be the kind of grief that happens when you lose a family member or someone who is as close to you as family. The poet Maya Johnson echoes this understanding from her own experience. These deep friendships, she says, can become family connections in terms of the way we support each other and the way we share major life events with each other. Making a commitment, whether it is spoken or unspoken. Compared to biological families where we don't have a choice, some chosen families can feel more like an authentic expression of ourself, an expression that can deeply satisfy and perhaps be more satisfying than the ones we get with biological families. Our children had aunts and uncles that were not really their aunts and uncles. But the relationships they had were defined by the level of commitment and responsibility these important people had in their lives for years. Some of you know that Shannon and Ryan Stites were in seminary with me at the same time. And when they had their son Jake, before they came to First Church as associate ministers, Fred was Jake's nanny. 
And Jake and Fred have formed this bond that is never ending. In fact, when Jake was born, we walked in just after he had been born, and the doctor handed Jake to Fred first. So the two of them, even though there is no blood relation, are as close as can be. I think of other families that consider Fred their grandpa and the time that they love spending with him. Those connections are ones that are very different than what we have with our own biological families. Commitment and responsibility are two important components, and they continue to surface in conversations with people about the family that has been created. Through all of this, it seems if there is space in our hearts, then our hearts will be open for someone to come into that space. I love the idea that there is a space in our hearts to hold another person and that the capacity of our hearts grow when we allow other people to become part of us. Perhaps chosen families do begin in our hearts. Perhaps it is that space in our hearts that longs for and is willing to work for deep commitment. This seems to be a commitment that goes beyond what one experiences with most other people. It's one that stays with you through thick and thin. This is a commitment you understand you will not walk away from, not because you can't, but because you don't choose to. I have learned more with each year that we are here that Los Angeles is a city in constant motion. People move here almost as quickly as they move away. For most of us, the people we come from are far away. And it's easy for us to believe, even though we can't see everyone's family, that people do, in fact, have a family. But whether our family is far away because of distance, distance measured in miles, or emotions, many of us need to find the support and love of a chosen family. Most of us need to have a group of people who are crazy about us and who help us find ourselves in the midst of questioning our identity, our faith, and our place in this rich environment that is home to 10 million people. First Church is a welcoming community. It is something we do really well, and yet there is still so much more that we can do together. Imagine First Church becoming even more open. Imagine us reaching out, creating connections and opportunities for connections. Imagine us pushing the boundaries of welcoming everyone. People of all backgrounds and abilities, people with screaming children and people with laughing children, people who are young and people who are old, people who are all colors and gender identities and sexual orientations, people who need to find a family that is there to catch us when we need to be caught. And most of all, people who will remind us that we are loved and celebrated exactly the way we have been created. Many of us know that welcome here. Many of us have felt that this is our place, that we are each other's people. Slade said as she stood looking at the work entitled Interconnected and contemplated the connected circuitry pieces that dominated this wall of the museum, she became aware that the unifying piece was the background, the context for all those random parts. Imagine this beautiful cathedral being the background for this city. Granted, being the background isn't always the most exciting part, but it is what anchors all the other parts. What an extraordinary gift we have been given in this place and in this time. And I know that together we are going to do amazing things with this gift in the City of Angels. May it be so.
may it be so for us. Amen.